Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Billy Ford of Apex Alchemy Knives. You may know Billy from his YouTube channel, where he talks all things knives on discussion videos, reviews, and live streams. But recently, Billy turned that love of carrying and using knives into a passion for building them. Under Apex Alchemy Knives, Billy, with the help of a custom knife phenom, is producing two fixed blade models that I know of using both fully handmade and mid-tech processes. We'll find out from Billy what it's like to go from enthusiast to commentator to maker. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. Plus, share the show with a friend. That really helps. And uh, also, so does Patreon. Go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon if you want to help support the show that way. Uh, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion. Featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave. Billy, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Pleasure to see you, sir. Man, thanks for having me on, Bob. It's, a, it's an honor, man. It's great. It's great to be here. Uh, the honor is mine, and uh, as is having a couple of your knives in hand that you sent to me, um, I'm very impressed with what you've sent, and we're going to talk about them, dig into them, find out all about them, and I, hopefully you have some examples on your end, but if not, I've got, uh, I think I've got it covered on mine. Thank you for sending these over. I appreciate it. Not a problem. I actually, I had two examples here and I left them both with the sheath maker today. I've, uh, I've discovered there's a leather worker, uh, or is that what you, what do you call a leatherman? Uh, what, what is it? I, uh, I don't know. Leather. I like leatherman. That, that works I do for me. too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was a, there's a guy that works leather. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's just a little bit past Jed and, and, uh, I'm not really happy with my Kydex, you know, making it, uh, it's either too tight or it's too loose. It takes me four or five hours to make a sheath. Uh, I was like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to get somebody else involved, get some good sheaths. Cause like you got to have a good sheath, man. If, if, if a knife isn't easy to carry, you know, you're going to pass it up. And I've got several examples around here that prove that, you know, like I love the knife. I don't like the sheath. Uh, I don't carry it, you know, like, like what, what knife since we're there? Oh man. Um, I like the company, so please don't, you know, this isn't a bashing thing, but, uh, you know, like, um, uh, I could, I could fix this, you know, myself, you know, now, but like the, the black rhino, which, uh, this is a giveaway mm -hmm. knife. I still need to get it, get it out, but I'm not crazy about these, uh, these clips yeah. that are on here and there's the holes don't really go up high enough to, uh, to put it on my belt where I, I want it, you know, like I, I could, uh, I could utilize a, uh, a clip here, but then the knife's going to ride so high. Um, there's okay, another and, top. And, and yeah, top tops knives. Oh, that's a cool knife too. Uh, yeah, tops knives. They they have some great uh, some great sheaths. But I agree with you. I'm not a fan of that rotating spring clip. But before we go too far down that rabbit hole, because uh, I know we could we could talk we could go down a lot of different paths uh, talking about knives. Um, Absolutely. Uh, uh, but you know, we're going to talk about your knives, but before we do, I want to find out about you. I know, um, I mean, I first met you on Thursday night knives, you commented and you were on the road, uh, you drive for a living and, uh, uh, but you're also a knife enthusiast. Tell, have you always been a knife guy? And tell me about that. Not, not really. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I to be honest, I was working at the place that I'm working now. I've, I've always carried a knife. Like I, I've always either had a Swiss army knife or, a, um, uh, you know, some sort of uh, slip joint in my, in my pocket. But, um, I was working with a guy named Taylor. He's a friend of mine. Um, I haven't seen him in quite some time. We don't work, work together anymore, but he, uh, he pulled a bench made, uh, it was a Alan Ellishwitz design of some sort. I don't, I don't, I can't remember the model and I probably butchered Alan's name, but um, he was flipping it and he was just letting it 
you know, do its thing on the access lock or whatever. And I was like, what is that, dude? And I, he was like, this is a benchmate. And I was like, what is a benchmate? And, you know, he was like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, man. I mean, this was, this was probably 2016, 2017, something like that. And he, uh, he, he let me handle it. And I was like, what's, what's something like this cost? And he was like, I gave 250 for this knife. And I was like, 250. I was like, I was like, I was like, I can't believe that, you know, like, you know, knives go that high. He said, Oh, they go a lot higher than that. So like me and him developed a friendship and, and his love for knives actually got me into knives. And I started buying them pretty quickly after that. I didn't realize, I didn't realize there was a, uh, you know, a market for, for like, uh, I would have called bench made a high end knife at the time. And yeah. still there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them, but like, I've just kind of graduated past that now, you know? Right. Right. It's, it's not what you uh, put, put at the top, but um, so do you think that it's uh, something that was inherently there? I'm trying to get to a universal theory of, of knife appeal. Oh uh, yeah. Do you think it was something that was dormant in you. Absolutely, man. My, my dad, my brother, my, you know, both, both served in the, in the military and, uh, you know, gifts often were knives. I, I remember getting a Gerber Gaber, a, a Gerber Gator, uh, from my brother when he, uh, he got back from boot camp. That was, uh, when I was 15 or 16, I didn't really carry it. It had a pouch. I uh, didn't have a pocket clip type thing, but, um, it was kind of big. I just like, tried to stick it in my pocket. And I remember every time I took it out of my pocket, it would flip my pocket out. Uh, but even before that, you know, my, my dad, he was, uh, he always carried a ballast song, like always carried a ballast song. Really? And, uh, That's cool. Yeah. He didn't know any tricks. Like I, I remember like, you know, he was kind of a comedian and, and people would ask him about tricks and he was like, I know one trick with it. And they, they take it out and he'd open it, you know, flip it open. And like, that's, that's the trick I know to get it to where I need it, you know, to use it. And then I'm, you know, flip it back closed. It, it wasn't a, it, it, it wasn't really a circus act with it, you know, like, um, but watching those guys play with those things is, uh, is mesmerizing, but I, I've never, I've never learned any tricks either. But uh, yeah, man, I've had I, I've had li- I've had knives. I guess my first knife that meant anything to me. Uh, I graduated eighth grade, and somebody gave me one of my parents, one of my dad's friends, gave me a uh, Boker Tree Brand, hmm. and it had like a pearl type of handle to it. It was a it was a German made knife. It was beautiful, and I carried that knife until I was uh, just about married. And I, I, I wound up losing it. I have no idea what happened to it, but I probably, I, I think I carried that knife for, I don't know, 12, 13 years or something like that, you know, before I lost it. Yeah. Man, but, I, I'm when sorry, I, go ahead. When, no, no, I was just going to say, when I lose knives and it happens every once in a while, I, I hope that it gets in the right hands. That's always my hope. Yeah. It's not yeah. some dirt bag who, who, uh, who stole it or, is going to go do a crime, but it's someone who really needs it. Right. Yeah. And this was like a full size Congress. I didn't know that at the time, you know, but like, I I know it now, you know, like I was, you know, I I can go back and, and find something identical to it or close to identical to it. But it seems like every time I find a Congress, uh, you know, made by Boker, and I'm not saying that would be the one to get, I just kind of want to replace it for for nostalgia reasons. But um, every, every time I run across one, it's not, it's not German made. It seems to be uh, uh, Chinese, which I'm not saying that matters. I'm, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm looking for the identical. Well, but knife. in terms of a boker, it does. <clears throat> if you want the, the highest quality boker, you'll, you'll get the, the German. Yeah. Made. So, so let me ask you, you make this friend at work and uh, he opens your eyes. Benchmade is the, is your gateway knife. Uh, what was your first, like, you know, I'm, I'm laying down some serious cash for this knife. Uh, what was it? Benchmade 940 and it was fake. You know, uh, oh, I, I, I got, I got online, I got on eBay and I was looking, uh, like I didn't know there was knife stores, but I started, you know, I, I've always been an eBay aficionado. So like, you know, I, I got on eBay and I was looking for a 940. I actually, I was just scouring Benchmades and I, I ran across Warren Osborne's design and I was like, I've got to get one of these, man, this is cool. But like the one that I found was like, 208 or something like that i can't remember why um because it was legit that's why yeah because it was legit (laughs) but well you know the the legit price back then for the the aluminum and uh i think the uh 
the, the 940-2 had just come out in G10. And like you could get either one of those models for sub 200, but the 940-1 and S90V, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and carbon fiber, I want to say that knife was like 250 or 260. This one just was like priced in between. And I, you know, still to this day, I really don't know what made it special. But um, I was shopping around and I was like, you know, I found one, I found a 940 dash two for um, 75 bucks. And I was like, I'll, I'll grab that one. It's used. It's, it's good to go. You know, I get it. Uh, I handed it to Taylor and he was like, Hey man, if you're happy with it, you're happy with it, but it's not real. And then I found out they made fake knives, you know, like, you know, it's, uh, so like that, 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 that sent me down a rabbit hole too, you know? So it was, uh, it was, it was kind of interesting, but then I, I replaced it with a real 940 dash two. I just bought it straight from, uh, blade HQ, you know, uh, Taylor sent me to blade HQ and it was over from there. <laughs> That's funny. And it probably opened your eyes, man. Uh, a whole new market, uh, that you're interested in. And now you find out, uh, they make fakes, uh, fugazis in that, in that market. It's, it's kind of funny. Uh, so your, your, your taste grow, how, how do you, do you use knives for work? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, I use knives every, I will, I will say every other day because typically I spend one day at my job driving to my location. I'll get down there. I'll find a spot. I'll, I'll pull over. I'll, uh, I'll stay the night. I get up the next day and I, I break down my own load. So wherever I'm delivering to, I've got to go on the dock. I've got to cut, uh, which is, uh, it's shrink wrap is what I would call glorified saran wrap. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a few millimeters thick. And, you know, I'll run it. it some of these pallets are 72 inches tall and, um, I'll, I'll run it from the top to the floor. And, uh, I do that 28 to 30 times, you know, per day. And, uh, it, I, my knives go through some abuse, man, but like, that's, uh, that's a, that's about the extent of it, but it makes testing edges easy because it's always the same. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's, mm -hmm. if I want to test one knife against another, uh, or somebody's 154 against somebody else's 154, I can be like, well, this, you know, this, this knife over here with a similar edge, uh, lasted six weeks where this one only lasted two, you know? Um, but anyway, yeah. So was it that repetition that, that, uh, daily or every other day repetition and kind of informally testing knives and edges that got you to start your channel? No, uh, what got me to uh, start my channel was, uh, I, I think the, one of the second knives or real, you know, one of the first five knives that I bought was a uh, Benchmade Rift and it came in and it had a uh, coating on it, but I bought it used off of eBay and it was, it was totally trash, man. It was, uh, the, the coating on it was, was ridiculous. So I sent it back into Benchmade and I got a new blade put on it and I asked them, I said, can I just get it without the coating? I'm not really crazy about the look of the, you know, the coating being half off. And they were like, that's fine. And they charged me 30 bucks. And this was back in, uh, I don't know, 2017, 2018, something like that. And I had, uh, um, I broke my, I broke the tip off my 940 dash two, uh, somewhere around COVID, you know, like I, I guess it was like 2020, 2021, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but I broke the tip off of it. And, uh, I went to, you know, price, you know, what was, what was going on with replacing the tip, the warranty. And I realized it was $90 now. So it like tripled in price. Hmm. And I put out my first video. I was like, don't need no subscribers. Don't need none of that. I'm just putting out this video to let you guys know that Benchmade has tripled their prices on a, on, on a blade replacement. Wow. I'm sure they have the reasons, but instead of doing that, I'm just buying a Kershaw link. So like, you know, it was in 20 CV and, you know, and, and the knife was okay. I just, you know, I don't, I learned that I don't like assisted opening knives yeah. very much. Yeah. So so that was the the birth of Apex Alchemy, your YouTube knife channel. Uh, not well, not necessarily calling out Benchmade, but uh, uh, a public service announcement in a way. Public service announcement, man. I never really wanted to be a knife reviewer. You know, like I, I always wanted, to, like after that, people started watching the video and asked me when I was coming out with something else because I, I, it was probably two months you know like i uh and they were like are you ever gonna record anything else if not i'm gonna i'm gonna leave and i was like well um what i do 
videos on because I don't want to be a knife reviewer. So I've, I've always tried to find something different. Um, and some of it's not pleasant to talk about, you know, but like, uh, I, I, I'm, in order to add value to the knife community, I think we got some really great reviewers out there. And I don't really think that I ever fit the bill of being a knife reviewer. So how do I add value? You know, and some of the stuff was like, when you called that one video I made, you know, about where all these materials come from and your super steels, oh, yeah. dig them up and, you know, Congo and stuff. And you, you're like, it's sobering, you know, and it is in a, you know, it, it kind of, it's kind of a killjoy to share this information. So when I go down these rabbit holes and I do research. Well, wait, just uh, explain what you're talking about there. What that video was about. Uh, that video uh, was about, you know, where, uh, you know, a uh, cobalt comes from, comes from the, you know, the Congo. And uh, it's mostly children that are digging it up out of the ground, you know, and, and at point of AK-47. Um, and it, it's not just, most of that cobalt's coming out of the ground for, for batteries, for electric cars, you know, like, but something, you know, like eventually that cobalt's going to make it, you know, you know some of it's going to make it, make its way into some of your uh, higher end steels that I love, like Rec 76, you know, is the steel that I, I stand behind. We got, I think the, I want to say it's like 7.6% tungsten and uh, like maybe 8% cobalt. So like it, like both of those minerals or elements, come out of the ground and, and you know at the cost of slave labor i got you i got you and and those are particularly exotic steels that re require those elements but if you get a a more uh, pedestrian steel it won't require that and yeah yeah and and i'm, I'm not in, those, other than in that. those in those amounts in those amounts i should say yeah, yeah that that was that was a good so those those are kind of the discussion videos i was talking about up front uh, uh and and i feel like a lot of uh, you're you're a hrc uh guy and what i oh, mean man. by that is is i know that you've uh it's been a topic of discussion quite a bit I had to get HRC tester anyway, you know, because I was I was heat treating my knives in the forge. Mm -hmm. uh, so I figured it was a service I could offer. But that's another rabbit hole. And that's not one that we should probably go down, um, especially not right now. We can talk about it in private if you want to. But I, I mean, I have went into it and let people know about the, the variances and the, and the tolerances being uh, uh, on, on the Rockwell scale. Let's go down it for a second. Can we go down? Yes, just, for, do. just for a second. I don't want to kill anybody's joy, but we see. Um, I'm going to use an example. Pinder come out with, um, you know, uh, the Project X in Magna Cut. Mm -hmm. uh, he was doing it at 61 or 62. People weren't happy. They wanted it at 63 or 64. Mm -hmm. All right. So my problem with that is, is I've got an owner's manual to this machine and it's the same machine that Larry and Thomas owns. And it's also the same machine that Jed owns. And it's the same machine that, that Brian from Transparent Knives Home. So I trust the machine, but mm -hmm. the owner's manual goes into it. You know, the room needs to be 70 degrees. It also needs to be, uh, well, I mean, that's about the, that's about the best you can do with it. Make sure it's got oil in it and it's gotta be 70 degrees, but the indenter that you use has a two point variable or tolerance. Uh, the uh, weights. So you, the machine you mean, itself, you mean the material itself uh, can, 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 uh, mold, uh, like alter its shape depending on the hardness of what it's testing? Well, it can just be off by two points. You know, okay. like the, okay. the indenture can be, the indenture can be off by two points. That's what's penetrating the steel. Also, the, the testing block, the calibration block can be off by two points. The machine can be off by two points. You, if you take all those, those numbers, that's six points. You slide those, those numbers over to the soft side and whatever the number is reading, it could literally be six points softer than that, or it could be six points harder than that. And I did a little test not too long ago. I didn't make a video. I've got a lot of people asking me to quit talking about this because it's killing joy. You know, like people want to believe what they want to believe. And I'm not a very good comforter. You know, the truth isn't going to change to comfort me. It's the truth isn't going to change to comfort you. But there's a very simple solution to this. And some people don't want to hear it, but there's three different ways you can test the, 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 the hardness of a steel. You got the Vickers scale. Um, that is the most accurate scale 
known to man for testing hardness of steel. Then you have the Brennell scale, which is probably the least accurate uh, way of testing the hardness of steel. And then you have the Rockwell scale, which is the oldest and the most trusted way of testing the hardness of steel. This isn't a problem except for the fact that we want to beat up companies that don't get within two or three points of what we're asking for. Mm -hmm. And some of these people are, are HRC in their knives in a shop that's 75 degrees. So this little test I did, you know, I, I, I set the thermostat at 70. I calibrated my machine. My, my calibration blocks at 63. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for the knives that I am making. I don't, I don't necessarily care what tops is running the rock well at as long as I can sharpen it and it holds an edge for as long as I need to. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the deal is, is, um, there's a fly in here, but the, um, uh, what was I saying, Bob? You were okay, saying so, that you, I'm sorry, dude. You um, put your, put but, your shop to 70 and yeah, yeah. I, I set the, I set the, the, the thermostat to 70 degrees I, I took a scanner and I scanned the the test block. It was at 70 degrees. I had to let the room. We we you generally keep it around 64, 65, something like that. We we live in a in a you know in the Arctic. But uh, we uh, we I, I scanned the indenter. I scanned the calibration block. Uh, everything, even the knife blade, was all within 70 degrees range, right? And we tested the knife, and it was uh, it tested at like 61 or something like that, right? I go back. And and turn my my thermostat back down to sixty five, and I give it about eight or nine hours. And I, I when I get up in the morning, I go in there and start scanning everything. It's right around that sixty five degree mark. The all the indenter, the the test block, the blade. I test it. It's testing two points higher. Hmm. Wow. You know, and what happens wow. to steel when it gets cold? You know, when when steel gets cold, it contracts. It gets harder, man. You know, like so. If it's negative seventeen degrees outside, and you drop your your knife on on a um, on the concrete, it's probably going to break. It's going to it's going to become more brittle. It becomes more brittle because it's harder. And so, like I, I, I bumped that thermostat up to seventy five degrees, and in, lo and behold, it tested four points harder, or two points hard. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, four points softer, or two points softer than the 70 degree benchmark. So just the variation of 10 degrees has a four point, a four point variance of how that machine's gonna operate. And you catch a lot of flack when people, when you, when you uh, run numbers and, and people aren't, they're not seeing the points that they wanna see. Okay, this is what I was gonna say. How can, how can that be killing the joy? Uh, since joy is the word of the season, how, how can that be killing the joy? It's, uh, you know, that's, that's good information to have. It's also, um, it's also somewhat reassuring that if a problem needs to be solved, it can be solved by changing the, you know, by reading the manual basically, but we're guys, lots of us don't read manuals. That's uh, great. So, so to me, that shouldn't, <clears throat> that shouldn't be a, uh, uh, that that sh that shouldn't be a killjoy. That should be like that's good information to have, and well, also after, yeah. also people should probably probably admit that the reason they're concerned about HRC is so that they know they're getting the most from their money, not because they notice it uh, in performance. Right, man, and you know I I, I look at it as just information. You like I I like to put the information out there, and you do whatever you want to with it. I don't. I'm not asking anybody to feel any kind of way about the information I put out there, I, uh, and I'm not asking anybody to subscribe to it. You don't have to believe what I'm saying. It's all it's all free information. You know, like if you get on Google or whatever. But yeah. it surprises me how many people get hung up on a couple of points, Bob. They'll they'll, they'll you know, if I tested a Kun Wu Padre and it was supposed to be 61 to 63 and I think I got, or, or I'm sorry, it may, it may have supposed to have been higher than that. 62, 63, 64, something, something like that. I think I got a 60 to 61 and my comments were full of people saying, <laughs> I didn't know what I was who talking about, who, man. Who bought the Padre? <laughs> right. Uh, the, the Padre, um, which is a beautiful it, knife, by the way, it is, it is a beautiful knife. And it was, uh, it, I, I believe that one belonged to Mitch Bullock, but, uh, you know, he sent it in for testing, but, um, 
you know, and I, I explained this to Mitch and he seemed to get it, you know, and I was trying to, you know, I, I put out a video trying to explain the, uh, the way these, uh, these HRC machines can be off by a couple of points. It's not even that big of a deal. And, and you got a lot of people trolls, I guess you would call them, you know, saying like this, no, that's not the way it works. You know, as long as it's calibrated, it's actually great. You know, like, and they, they, there's so many, there's so many variations or, or not. There's so many variables that go into the, the final number that, it's not just as simple as it seems, you know, like I've, I've seen, I've seen several people that do HRC testing on, you know, uh, on YouTube that people trust and they're doing it in their garage. And unless they live in Ecuador, <laughs> it's probably not 70 degrees inside that garage. Right. I, I you know? You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. it. Well, I mean, so basically also what you're saying is that, uh, Hinderer might be shipping a knife that that purports to be a certain hardness and actually is a certain hardness. But when you test it, if your room isn't set up properly, uh, you could be wrong about it. That's so, right, man. I could be just as wrong as anybody else, you know. And and I, I don't mean I don't mean you in particular. Oh no, I mean, you set up your room. But I mean one who is testing it and like, uh, you know, I am a Hinderer devotee, and I am not though. I have four, and I love them dearly. Uh, it's like. Uh, uh, I'm a hinderer devotee and I know the answer I want to find out. So I'm going to do this test and um, I don't know if it's not set up properly. It could really vary. It could. It could vary. Depending it on could where vary they were. Yeah, all man. Right, all right. All right, all right. Well, no, 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 no. I, I don't mean to, uh, I don't mean to brush that aside, but it's this kind of passionate talk. And I, I know you, you are also someone who's, uh, from time to time, passionate about uh, blade geometry. Uh, I'm assuming that it's these kind of things, uh, these more technical uh, sides of things that led you to actually start making. Let's talk about how that happened and uh, how, how you got off the ground. Okay. Well, man, my name is, I, first of all, I'm, I'm an infant when it comes to knife making. You know, like I have got a great mentor, you know, but I'm simply just a protege right now. Um, Jed Hornbeek is teaching, you know, it's taught me just about everything that I know. Um, and the things he hasn't taught me that I think I, know, I probably need to forget. But the how I got started in knife making was Scab was, he was hosting a, a knife making competition. And he, Scab asked me if I was going to do it. And I had just met Jed, but I only met Jed as a customer. I was going over there. I, I, I think I bought, you know, four or five of his knives all together, something like that. And uh, I, I asked Jed, I said, are you going to are you going to enter the knife making competition? He said, no, man, I think that's more for beginners. You know, he said, are you going to join? Are you going to enter the knife making competition? I said, dude, I wouldn't know where to start. He said, I got a piece of steel here, baby CRV2, if you want to give it a shot. And I was like, I was like, dude, I don't know what these machines do. And he was like, that's OK. He said, I got you back. He said, I'll teach you how to use the machines, but you got to do all the work. And I was like. Okay, you know, like I'll try, you know, man, it it was in me, you know what I mean? Like whenever I left, I, I left that experience and it, you know, a couple of weeks, I, you know, that amygdala that you have that has the micarta handle, I probably had 37 hours logged into that knife, you know, like I, I, I was trying to keep up with how long it took and I was only, I was over Jed's house like three or four hours a day, sometimes six or seven, but it took forever to make that knife. And so I was over there for, you know, several weeks, not, not all at once, you know, it'd, it'd be a couple of days this week, a couple of days that week, whatever our schedules, you know, would allow uh, to match. And we would, uh, you know, he, he would let me use his machinery. And uh, it was, it was a very awesome experience. But whenever I, I, I finished that experience, I was like, I, I can't just not do this, man. You know, like I've got to be able to continue to do this, you know, like, so I started asking him about advice about, you know, like what, what type of two by 72 grinder do I need to buy, you know? And then it didn't take long to realize how expensive all this stuff is, but it didn't really stop me from, <laughs> you know, like filling up the shop full of machines, but it was, uh, it was something I knew that I wanted to do for the, you know, for the rest of my life, even if it's small scale, you know, it's, it's, but you had four Jed Hornbeek, brand new Jed Hornbeek knives you could sell. Uh, would you do something like <laughs> I'm saying that sarcastically? I mean, because I, I have one of his knives and, you know, I 
I don't want to think about parting with it, you know? Right. No. Yeah. It's uh, my brother did end up with a couple of those. Scav has one uh, that may end up being his. And then what's the point? ADC has my fourth one. And Courtney's got one around here somewhere like a, a Hanzaki, um, mm -hmm. which one of those uh, uh, wrapped handle like Japanese style knives. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, uh, I don't actually even have one of my horn beaks in the house, but my brother did buy a couple of them so I could uh, oh, nice. uh, finance a machine. And with my brother owning it, it's you know like we we have like this thing like you know uh he can come get any knife he wants yeah. and, you know and and vice versa so it like didn't really leave permanently you know it's i like family. i can i got visitation rights bob yeah you know what <laughs> I, I mean hear you. yes <laughs> yeah it's in the family i know exactly what you mean it's a great way to keep knives sort of uh so uh with uh this knife. So this is the one that you made in Jed or, or a one that you made in Jed Hornbeak shop. Is this where it started or, um, you know, what, what did you, okay. So I know that you were working in his shop and you just said that you, uh, got a two by 72. Like, was that your first machine? And, um, like, tell me about these two. Okay. So that the one with the micarta handle, with, it's got a flat grind. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And that was actually like the second knife that I made. The first, I'd actually started grinding the hollow grind on a uh, another knife and I screwed it up completely. Like I didn't ever complete it, but I did complete one other knife um, and I've got it here, but it's out of reach right now. But I completed one other knife uh, that I was going to uh, send into the competition. And, you know, at, at Jez, you know, like advice, it was like, you're going to build another one out of that, you know, cause he, he, I think he gave me 48 inches of, of, um, bar stock. And I was like, uh, I was like, do I need to? And he was like, man, he said for a bushcraft knife, it really don't have that long of a blade, you know? So I, I actually made one with a really long handle and a little short blade. And it really wasn't, uh, like set up for bushcraft. Well, neither is the amygdala, you know, really, I mean, it's not really a bushcraft knife, but, I thought I was supposed to be designing something brand new, you know, like, uh, you know, like not trying to reinvent the wheel, but like yeah. coming up with my own idea of what a bushcraft knife could be. But like, um, it was apparent after I, I saw the other knives in the competition that it was okay just to make a, you know, a, a drop point knife, you know, that, that, that's a tried and true, you know, and, uh, and had I known that that's probably what I would have done, but yeah, I'm glad I did the amygdala cause it, I got a lot of, great feedback off of it you know like some some stuff to work on uh also you know i got a lot of positive feedback on it where uh you know some people said it was like the, one of the most comfortable handles they've ever held in their life and that means the world to me because i just drew it up on steel dude you know uh, well something about the long handle on the amygdala uh it reminded me of the um the jx uh from from uh prepared mine 101 and uh tough uh work tough gear you know with the extra yeah. handle and the big uh, clip point blade same yeah. thing it, it gives you a lot of leverage for chopping here obviously up in that choil uh you can get real close to what you're working on get the thumb up there and all that but you have a whole other like you could have seven i could have seven of my fingers on this i could uh, too and you can come back here you have a full handle grip for chopping if you have a uh a uh, fob or a or a lanyard i mean you're all the way back here so uh, i th i thought the the handle size was a really good idea for a bushcraft knife actually it kind of makes it hard to carry i'm I, like I, I i need to i you know i that's in the works like getting a sheath that's made for a knife with that long of a handle you know that was uh that was the first suggestion from the leather uh man the leatherman mm -hmm. he uh he, he was like you make it that that uh that handle a little shorter to be a little less heavy and i was like I, we ain't messing with that handle <laughs> but, but the the second one that, that you uh showed the the one with the red and the the black acrylic um or whatever that is it's it, they call it composite i'm i'm assuming it's going to be acrylic resin bonded something other but um that one uh so the blade is actually water jetted heat treated and hollow ground uh by brad vice or one of his employees you know like so i, I don't i don't know that brad vice actually did it but you know he owns alabama damascus okay. and you know, so that one's in 5160 instead of adc rv2 
Um, and he did offer ADC RV2, and I don't have a problem with ADC RV2, but I, I've learned that I really like 5160. So I wanted to Why? I wanted to try that still. I'm sorry? Why do you like 5160? Man, it's... As far as a tough steel, it's tough. Right. It holds. Okay. Yeah, it's it's it, no, you're good. I'm sorry. I'm I'm uh I'm, I'm probably interrupting you a lot, mm -hmm. but the um the it's a tough steel. It holds an edge pretty decent. It doesn't hold an edge as long as ADC RV2, but it does hold one, you know, fairly decent for a, a, a low alloy carbon, and it's uh there's just nothing wrong with it you know it doesn't rust as easy as adc rv2 for whatever reason probably because it's a nickel compound uh but uh or it may not be i don't know i i i'm not sure if uh 5160 has nickel in it or not but it's uh it, it seems to not rust as easy um but that's that's something that's never really been a, a great big concern of mine man I, I don't mind putting a little oil or you know some some wax you know, on, on my blades to, to keep them out of the weather. Yeah. So what's your, um, how, how do you, what's your process? Well, I don't really have a process, you know, like I wouldn't say I have anything that's tried, true and perfected. Uh, but I ordered five amygdalas from Brad, um, and 20 Raptoras, the, the smaller knife. Yeah. And, uh, when I got them in, I realize uh, like 11 of those Raptoras are going to need to be uh, reground. So, uh, Satu Dave is going to take care of that. You know, Satu Dave? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So, he's going to do the regrounds on those. And we're, I get them back, man. I'm going to put some handles on them. You know, like, but all I'm really doing, like on the Raptora, I'm crowning the spine. I'm doing the finish, whatever, you know, we're going to uh, bead blast it or, uh, you know, and, and stone wash it. Or we, we may, uh, we've done a few that, have an acid wash or fer uh, ferric fluoride um and then i stone wash it afterwards but um you know i first thing i do is crown the spine and then i, I put the handles on and we decide what finish is going to go on there and then uh that's about it you know, but, so i mean i say that's it but your process is you're 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 making knives like mid-tech makers make knives in a way like, uh, you know, ha having some of the pieces made here, having them, some of them made here, but you're, you're producing it or you're like, um, conducting the orchestra, yeah. so to speak, uh, putting them together and, and shipping them out. Yeah. I, you know, Ken Onion termed the, you know, mid tech, you know, I think he come up with the definition for that. And, uh, you know, that it, it's a pretty, it, it, it's a simple definition, but it, it covers a wide range um, I spent about five and a half hours on those handles. Uh, and since everything else is done by hand here in America, um, you know, like uh, we are getting somebody else to do it. So it's not a full custom by me. Right. But some people would still consider it to be a semi custom. Yeah. I don't know the terminology, brother. You know, like I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm having fun with handles right now. You know, that's, uh, that, that's my goal is just to get good at handles. I just remember uh, Les George taught uh, what the first time I ever heard the term mid tech. He was like, "Oh yeah, yeah I'm, I'm making these V-seps in in the mid tech way," and and he was describing like having, you know, uh, like like a producer of a film does have the best guy who does this, do that, do and then bring it together, and then you do all the, uh, or or like maybe maybe a better. Um, a more apt analogy is like uh, old school painters who would make giant battle scenes and the painters themselves would only paint the important faces and hands. And then their atelier would paint the rest of everything else. You know, okay. it's like you're doing kind of the finishing work, like the, and, yeah. And the beginning work it's alpha and omega. Cause you're designing the thing. Uh, and by the way, I've, I've yeah. been using this to shave pencils. I hope you don't mind. And it's no, fan fantastic for it it's one of my one of the things i use my knives for most um <clears throat> this is the raptora let's talk about this because we were just talking about the amygdala uh with the with the large handle and the large leaf shaped blade uh for as an outdoor knife this is more of well tell us about this i wanted to come up with something like a uh, scab asked me about when he had possession of the amygdala he asked me he said man i said uh Megatron was kind of wondering if you can make that handle any smaller, you know, for uh, on a on a similar model. Um, just uh, you know, like maybe something with the 
a more usable uh, edge type or, 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 you know, whatever. So I was, I was just, you know, toying around with the Warncliffe idea, you know, leave the hump back there on the back. But I made that, I made the Raptora handle as small as I could to get a four finger grip on it um, without choking up, you know, like it was, and, and then, you know, I handed it to Courtney and she was like, it feels really good. And Courtney's got really small hands. So I was thinking maybe that's it. You know, I could probably go a little bit smaller with it, you know, for, uh, for if, if we're trying to keep females in mind, but I was having a lot of guys, a lot of friends say I'll buy an amygdala, you know, and I was like, man, you ain't even seen them yet, you know, and, and the amygdala is going to be expensive. You know, like it, I knew it was going to be expensive. It, it costs a lot of money to make the first one. Um, and I had a lot of people saying, I'm just going to buy this knife to support you. You know, like, I don't really care what it looks like, whatever. I was like, so I had a, I had a number of reasons to come out with the Raptora because the Raptora was uh, a smaller knife, a less expensive knife. You know, like I've, I've got it priced to the point where after shipping it to the customer, I'm not making anything and that's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't mind being at that point, but like, if you just want to support me, then it's a lot easier on the wallet to buy one of those than it is yeah. to buy an amygdala. And probably more likely that you're going to use it just due to its size and it's weight. It's nice and svelte and it's beautiful. This one with the, with the sort of uh, teal Terra tough and white handle um, crown spine. It's a very luxurious feeling knife with a very thin hollow grind. Um, yeah, man, this is a, this is a very nice, edc fixed blade and and malcolm holt is the one that's doing the edges on those knobs and he's a good friend of mine he's oh, nice he's been a supporter of the channel and uh he's just he, he, he does a really good job on edges you know and he's just he's just now started up his youtube uh i'm sorry his um uh, instagram page and i want to say he calls it the wizard's edge um so he's gonna start he's gotten to the point where he's comfortable with um you know taking taking customers you know so he's, he wants to start doing that and he asked me he was like do you mind if i put some edges on some of these knives you know so like um that that helps out a lot you know like i i can make a knife sharp but he does it better than me he's got a fixed angle system that he uses oh, yeah. and very consistent edge very nice edge on this uh so like so you have these two models um and they're pretty different you know, this one's a, a very fine, uh, thin, hollow ground, and this one's a big, uh, you know, uh, pretty stout outdoors knife. I, I wouldn't plink about batoning this one through wood, though. I won't because it's not mine. But you can do that. You can do okay, it. I will. <laughs> uh, that's only <laughs> one of the. That's one of the few things I do with my fixed blades that is fun. Uh, Brother, but, it's it's a. It survived Donnie B all day and it survived Scab. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. They both okay. got videos on it. I, yeah, I, yeah. I urge you to use it. Or, you know, uh, like, if you break it, I'll be honored. <laughs> <laughs> well, after knowing what they do, this will be a vacation. Walk in a park, <laughs> walk in the park for this knife. But uh, uh, what I was saying is, okay, you have one that's like very uh, svelte and thin and would be great for EDC, especially with the grind and the thinness and everything. And this, uh, at, you know, I you said you want to do this now for the rest of your life. Uh, what, where do you see it uh, going? And uh, uh, like in terms of design, because uh, I'm interested in the process that arrived at both of these designs, and and how do you um, plan on maintaining your your design your your catalog, if you will? Okay, um, man, I'm kind of taking. I'm taking a page out of the the Strider or the the Chris Reeve book. You know, I don't want to be one of those guys that have like 50 models out there. I respect those guys. You know, like it's great. Like I mean, Jed has a lot of models that he makes, right? But I would rather have you know the next one I want to do. I want to do a, a standard drop point, um, and then I want to do a clip point of some sort. But I I want to if I can keep it around four models for you know for a while and and just see how those models go i mean I, more than likely one of them would die out like just there just won't be as much interest in that knife and it'll have to it'll have to move on you know mm -hmm. uh and that's just the way it is right so um i don't i don't strive to be a tops 
uh, uh, in a in in the sense of having a you know catalog, I'd like to have a few good useful models uh, that people you know uh, don't mind carrying because they're comfortable to carry, and they're I want to keep them as uh, as an affordable price as possible. Uh, the prices can't stay the same as they are right now, but as I get better, you know that'll come with time. Um, and then the uh, you know I, I'm giving myself nine years, Bob. Uh, you know, by the time I'm fifty. I would like to be able to call myself a knife maker, you know, like, I mean, I'm making knives right now. Right. But by the time I'm, you know, I'm 41 right now, mm -hmm. if I can, if I can do this for nine years, hone my skills, you know, yeah. uh, I, I think it was crazy. Dustin driver, you know, is, is a good friend of mine. And, uh, he had asked me, you know, like I, I showed him the knives and he was like, man, you, uh, you kind of messed up the grind on that one a little bit. And I was like, well, I didn't do the grinds on these, but I'll, you know, I'll, um, thanks for pointing it out. And he's like, who did the grinds? And I was like, um, Brad Vice did the grinds. You know, I, I got him from Alabama to Damascus. He can do them cheaper than I can. And he can do them better than I can. So it, it just makes sense. I can pass those sevens on to the customer, right? But he was like, do you want to be a custom knife maker or do you want to be a handle maker, Billy? And I was like, <laughs> at, at first I was like, well, this, this, this jackass, you know, is what I was thinking. But I started thinking about that question, Bob, you know, and I'm out of state six days a week. You know, I don't, you know, what's wrong with designing a knife, having an OEM do it if they're doing it properly. And then me being able to put the handles on there, you know, um, it's, it's not being a full custom knife maker. And that's, that's very much true. Uh, but yeah, in the next nine years, I would like to, uh, hone my skills on on grinding bevels you know that that is the most challenging part for me right now keeping the the bevels even um and there's jigs and stuff out there that make it easier but like sure. you know it's spin well it's like yeah. anything else it takes lots of practice it takes muscle memory and stuff and that that will that will get there but you're like a regular person like me and everyone else and uh you're out of state six days a week or, or whatever the situation happens to be. So you're doing what you can. You're producing knives, which is cool. It's like you're, I mean, I keep coming back to other art forms, but it's like you're making a movie and you're not doing, you're not doing the shooting and the editing and the writing and the, and the craft services and the transportation. Uh, you're finding the, the appropriate people for that, but you're, it's That's your right. vision and you're putting it together. Um, that's kind of uh, that what, what I've, uh, done a little bit of dabbling with and and uh, for me I'm having other people do it all completely but it's still my design and and uh, it's very rewarding you know yeah yeah and I'm, I'd I'd much rather have my design right now made by Matt Chase than by me <laughs> so, absolutely man but in nine years uh, yeah I think that's a a really uh, generous um, and I don't mean that that's a generous amount of time to give yourself some people. The, the instinct might be I'm giving myself two years. And after that, you know, you know, not realizing that these kind of things take a long time to get great at. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and if, I'm, if I've only got one day that I can set aside and obviously I'm not going to set aside the whole day, I've got a family, I've got two kids and a wife. Um, so I'm going to get out there for a few hours on my day off. Uh, what I do in those few hours, um, yeah, yeah, generally, you know, I, I make a knife a week. You know, and uh, it don't take all week to do it, man. It takes about five hours. Uh, so I'll get out there a couple hours in the morning, get out there a couple hours in the afternoon, finish everything up. But uh, or, or if I don't finish it up, I'll finish it up next weekend, start on another one. But that's that's about the pace that I can move at um, with my job, you know, because, you know, like I'm a, I'm a truck driver. I'm, I'm out there on the road. Uh, I'm not I'm not home as much as I'd like to be. Uh, which is something else I could think about. That got nothing to do with knives. But as of right now, my situation allows me a, a specific amount of time to practice and hone my skills. And I figure nine nine years might not even be enough. You know, like because I'm I'm only, you know, if you I guess if you do the math, and I have not done the math, but if you take four or five hours a week, you multiply that by fifty two weeks, you got what two hundred fifty hours a uh, a year, um, and that's you know. By, by the time nine years gets there, that's not even a master at making handles yet. You got to do yeah, something yeah. 10,000 hours. Yeah. 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 You're part of the way there, but, but at the same time, it, 
you don't necessarily have to be a master to be no. effective. Um, and and as as uh, my wife and I will will tell our daughters from time to time, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good. Don't not do something because it's not going to be perfect. That's just right. Keep, you just keep doing it, and and it'll be better at some point. You know. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, you mentioned a clip point. What kind of? All right. Uh, this is just selfish. I'm just wondering because uh, uh, I love clip point blades. I love Bowie knives. And uh, I saw one in particular today that what looked a little different, but it was the same. And it's going to be coming out from tops and it knocked my socks off. So what what are you thinking of in terms of a clip point? What do you love in a clip point? I kind of like the buoy as well, but I'm 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 not a fan of like the, the humongous buoys. Like, uh, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. They're awesome to play with. But I, I would kind of like to try to make something along the buoy scale or, or buoy's style on a smaller scale, maybe a 10 inch overall uh, length, uh, which is pretty short for a buoy, right? But um, that that's it, it would probably have a taller, you know, what's in my head would be like a, a taller blade with a nice with with, with enough real estate to work its way up a, a hollow grind to to become nice and. Uh, um thin or whatever you know but the uh, uh the kershaw knockout which i know is not a buoy but you know i carried a kershaw mm -hmm. knockout which is an assisted knife and it's got a, it's got a clip point with it's just all belly right and I, I realized with that knife i was like this belly actually comes in handy you know and it's one of the very few clip points that i've ever carried for an uh, extended amount of time but drop points shine in almost every area but when when you get that situation where a clip point is actually helping you out a drop point simply isn't enough you know i mean i carry a drop point almost every day you know i got ad 15 that's my favorite carry knife i've uh, actually carrying your favorite knife of 2023 oh love that um yeah and uh and i love this knife you know uh, but i'm carrying that today but the I guess uh, something something along the lines of a buoy with a little bit taller of a blade, you know, like just try to come up with something unique. I was even thinking about putting a recurve on it, but I don't know, man. You know, those those that kind of makes it a little less useful, right? So my my uh, question uh, uh, has something to do with the point and the and the clip because uh, it seems like clip points a Bowie. It's a thin line between Sax and Bowie, and it's a thin line between sax and warncliff um and so so what i'm getting at is some some bowies have the tip lower and they're more utilitarian and some of them have more of that up sweep and up take swear. more advantage of that that belly but what i'm hearing is the belly is what you're appreciating the uh, belly is what i yeah yeah the belly is what i appreciate about them uh but i like what is courting's got a tops and i can't remember the name of it the linus lead i want to say and i mean it, it's it's got a trailing point, you know, like uh, to the point, I don't even know if you'd call it a clip point. Like it's, it's, it's coming way up, you know, but yeah. man, that is a useful camp knife. You know, it's, it, it's game processing, you know, catch some fish or whatever. It's, it's been an excellent knife for a lot of different things, but um, I don't, I, I don't think I'd want anything that extreme, but you know, having some belly, nothing wrong with having some belly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's what I tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so four, four to five models. Uh, um, but what kind of a company would you like this to become a company, or would would you like this to always be a side hustle? Um, no, I want it to be a company. Yeah, okay. I, I like. I want to build into the company thing, and I probably won't waste much time. I'll just probably have to like. I don't. I don't want to start it too soon because I know I'm gonna be making money, and you can only show losses for a couple of years before they start getting on your butt or whatever. I don't. But like, I'm. I want to start at at a time where I feel like I'm actually gonna be getting serious about it. My knives are gonna be really rare and hard to come by for a little while. Um, I'm not gonna be. You know, my my ambition is not to push out several knives a year i'm gonna go on spurts of what you know of um of making things you know like batches i guess you would say mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna try to work on something else like a different design or something that may take time so like if if i if i get 40 or so knives out in a year a year's time i'll be happy with that so like that's not 
business to me, you know, especially if you're not making any money off of it sure, or yeah. barely, you know, if you're bra barely breaking even, that's bad business. So I, I would like to get, I would, I, I feel like I'll know the time when it's right, Bob. I don't know if that's, if that's the case, but I, I feel like I'll know the time when it's right. When the, uh, my stuff is in higher demand and uh, everything, well, I don't, I haven't made that many, but everything's sold so far. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it gets any higher demand. I'm at hundred percent right now. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah. but go ahead. But go you ahead. Mean, well, you mean moving, moving, moving units, some, so to speak. That's right. That's right. Uh, moving more units. But uh, one thing, uh, you know, you, you have uh, an advantage or a sort of an accelerated growth in, in your mentorship. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's also something to, to take in, into mind. Uh, I, 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 I think the way uh, Jed does it is uh, kind of the way I would like to do it if I were to be a knife maker. He, he kind of just seems to uh, make small batches of whatever he feels like. That's and right. And they get man. snapped up. And if they're not snapped up immediately on Instagram, they go to, uh, uh, you know, Arizona Custom Knives. You know, I've seen a lot of his stuff over there. Yeah, and he's got his own website now too. And uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Like, I mean, it's jedhornbeat.com, but I'm not sure, like, you know, how that website's working out for him. But eventually, when I have some stock, I'd like to get a website as well. But uh, I, I think that does, you know, help maintain things. But there's so many different crazy business things to think about whenever you're you're selling things online. You know, uh, yeah, thirty percent. You're gonna lose thirty percent almost off the top because of PayPal fees and mm -hmm. you know uh, what whatever kind of fees are you know entail. You know, um, <clears throat> so it's a uh, it it is it is a, a different world. You, like you have to up those prices. You won't have a you won't have a choice. The prices will have to go up. Well, uh, maybe that maybe you just answered this question, but uh, you know, as we close here, what what have you learned so far? Uh, uh, going from knife YouTuber, knife enthusiast to maker, what what's the most valuable lesson you've learned so far? Don't be so critical uh, on other people's stuff, man. Um, that's starting kind of to become uh, like cringy to me, actually. Like uh, you know, now that I've made a few, and I know the processes are hard. Uh, whenever I'm I'm looking at somebody else's work uh you know it used to I, like i mean you can go back it, you don't have to go back that far you know you can you can see me reaming knives you know for the processes um and now i understand the processes a little bit better and i kind of can go back to those same knives and be like i understand why they did it this way i don't i may i may still not like it but i understand why they did it this way um you know the, but really dude you know if we're the most valuable thing that you, you know I've learned, you you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said I had like an advanced um, growth with my mentor, and that is true. You know, like there's a lot of people. You know, like I, I, I wouldn't want to imagine what my first knife would have looked like without Jed. You know, if I had to like go to Harbor Freight and just buy a grinder and yeah. buy buy a bunch of crap and try to make a knife out of it, then it would not have been the Amigdala or the Raptora. You know, like he he allowed me to mess up you know he allowed me to do things wrong you know and he was there to, to show me how to do things right and so i guess the most valuable thing i've learned really is how i've kind of won the lottery when it comes i'm not talking about financially i'm just talking about like i've got a world-class knife maker that lives 12 miles down the road from me that's willing to help me out and he's become a great friend and he could quit making knives tomorrow and i'd still be like just popping up in his house and he's selling kittens in ohio i'll ask him if he needs any help with it you know <laughs> <laughs> selling kittens in Ohio. well that that sounds like a good fallback plan uh if this whole knife thing doesn't work out but i have a feeling uh you're gonna do just fine billy thank you so much for joining me on the knife junkie podcast billy ford of alpex alchemy knives um, where can people catch up with you, find out what's going on with you and, and view your content? Well, we got the YouTube channel, Apex Alchemy Knives. Um, we have Instagram. I'm Billy Ford over there. Facebook, I've got that thing locked down like Fort Knox. I don't, you know, some people say they can't send me a friend request. I'm not really sure what's going on with that. Um, but you, you're welcome to add me on Facebook if you, if you can find me. 
Um, but yeah, in, anywhere, man, you know, uh, call Bob and get my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I'm not giving them the, the phone number to call me. So no, I'm just kidding. Oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, you, you can have it any day, Billy. Thank you so much for joining me, man. It's been a pleasure. Man, it was, it was great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Do you yeah, like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Billy Ford of Alpex, uh, Apex Alchemy Knives. Uh, do make sure to check him out on their uh, live. He does it with his wife sometimes. Uh, their live Saturday um, live stream and uh, other videos, especially if you want some uh, lively and sometimes polarizing knife talk. Uh, we all love that. And then uh, keep your eyes peeled. I have a couple of videos of this so far, uh, unboxing, uh, but... I got I got a special plan for one of these knives and I'm going to do a special kind of video. So keep your eyes peeled for that. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast